Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, webinar, which is um, hosted by Syro and Latro. It's all around uh, consumer innovation and focused on uh, health and well-being. Um, I'm Ingrid Applequist. Uh, I lead the Food Innovation uh, Centre at CSIRO, uh, and I'm joined today by uh, Darren Kuma, uh, who is the Strategic Relationship Manager, uh, which is on, in the office of the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor, uh, and he's at, at La Trobe University. So this is a joint La Trobe University and, and CSIRO webinar. Uh, I would like to make um, a welcome first. So uh, CSIRO and La Trobe University acknowledges that this event and our participants are located on the lands of many traditional custodians in Australia. Uh, we would like to begin by acknowledging the uh, Wurundjeri Wurundjeri and the Bunurong people as the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today. And I know that we are meeting on many lands uh, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. And we recognize uh, the continuing connection and custodian of the lands, the seas and waters um, throughout Australia. So this has been a, a collaboration between La Trobe University, we have been, you know, engaging with leaders across the horticulture value chain in particular, and I'm really delighted to be able to host our third webinar in this series, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge the support of the Food Innovation Australia Limited, um, one of the agri-food growth centres. Um, we have a great uh, speaker list today, uh, they are from three uh, states uh, and different time zones as well, so we've tried to mix it up a little bit. Uh, and we're really keen to be, uh, get their insights uh, and, and, and their innovative approaches uh, to in, uh, address the needs and preferences um, of consumers. It's really important uh, um, from a food perspective, especially food research, to actually really understand the consumer, what they are looking for and what are they demanding in food. So we want the sessions also to be interactive. Um, so we will hear short presentations from each of the speakers, followed by an opportunity uh, to ask questions. Um, there is a, a Zoom uh, Q&A function, a question and answer function. Please feel free to use it at any time during um, as the speakers uh, provide their talk. Um, and Darren will uh, then help to moderate the Q&A. So he'll look through the uh, chat uh, function or the question and answer function uh, and hopefully be able to ask questions on, on your behalf. If there are still any questions that uh, cannot be answered or haven't had chance time to be answered, then the uh, um, Q&A function will still remain live and uh, the presenters can um, answer you directly um, in, the in, in, the, in the function. So I would like to uh, start with uh, introducing our first speaker, uh, Bonnie Wiggins. Uh, she's one of our uh, early career scientists um, uh, at CSIRO. She's a behavioral researcher who works at our nutrition and health unit, which is based in Adelaide. Um, she's got experience in conducting consumer-based research and is currently working closely with the horticulture industry. Uh, she's working on a project uh, that aims at uh, increasing uh, children's vegetable consumption. So a lot of this has been around supporting the um, education of, of children and getting them involved with it, being interested in uh, fruit and veggies, playing with them, cooking with it and so on. And hopefully this will give a lifetime um, uh, learning to be enjoying vegetables for the rest of their lives. So I would like to, so last year, Bonnie was a member of a multidisciplinary research team. Uh, she was investigating the behaviors and attitudes of consumers um, with regard to fruit and veggies. Um, and this was done, analysis was done to find, to look at the innovations in horticulture and see, and this is what she's going to be sharing today. So her talk is identifying opportunities for innovation in horticulture, a consumer led approach. And over to you, Bonnie. Thanks, Ingrid. I'm just going to share my presentation and if Ingrid, if you could tell me if it's displaying correctly, that would be great. It's with the, you need to put it on full. It's displaying with your... Uh... Yep, so I'm just swapping it over. Is that... Perfect. Sorry, it's on the wrong side. All good. 
that all looks good now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'll just check the time, make sure I don't go over. Um, so, hi everyone, I'm Bonnie Wiggins. I'm a behavioural researcher at CSIRO. Thank you, Ingrid, for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, I'm here to present um, on our project, which was a consumer-led approach to identifying opportunities for innovation in horticulture. Um, this project is actually just in the process of publishing, but uh, this seemed like such a great opportunity for um, a really aligned project um, for this webinar, webinar. So here I am. <laughs> so what did we want to do with this project? Um, the purpose of our project was to gain an understanding of consumer drivers and demands for new value added innovations across horticulture. Um, why do we want to do this? Well, there was a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, because fruit and vegetable consumption in Australia and particularly vegetable consumption is lower than what's considered a healthy diet. Um, a possible way to increase fruit and vegetable consumption is by developing new products through innovation um, that offer new value to the consumer. Uh, there are many current market offerings that are attempting to do this. For example, um, pre-prepared products such as cut and partially cooked vegetables, um, novel products such as purple cauliflower or kaolettes, um, or new sizes such as mini cucumbers. Uh, however, the problem that we face is that new and novel innovations are generally um, quite costly and there is the inherent risk that um, uh, once that product has been developed that it may not be adopted by the consumer. So um, we believe that by understanding the needs of the consumer that risk can be mitigated. So how did we do this? Um, we conducted a consumer study with 761 participants the average age was 55 and 63% were female. Uh, this mixed method study asked some quantitative questions, but the majority were open-ended questions around consumer preferences, how consumers bought, used, ate fruits and vegetables. And all of these open-ended questions fit into a model called a value proposition canvas. I won't go into too much detail on the model, just given the time we've got, um, but essentially, this model evaluates a consumer's pains, gains, and jobs. So what do I mean by that? Um, pains means what barriers are there to use of a product. Um, gains is what encourages them to use the product, what facilitates the behavior. And customer jobs is why you use the product. Um, so what are the reasons for doing so? What job does the product do for you? Um, this model and those three things enable you to build a consumer profile and based on that, you can define a value proposition for innovation. So there were a handful of questions outside of that model, which we asked to help us get an understanding of the sample. So for example, some demographic questions and some questions around um, trying new fruits and vegetables, but the majority were those open-ended questions. Um, and then we conducted a thematic analysis looking at the major themes which arose in either gains, pains or customer jobs. So I'll get on to our results. Um, so if we were to start with customer jobs, the reasons for eating fruits and vegetables, unsurprisingly, health was the most significant theme that arose, the most significant reason for eating fruits and vegetables, um, with diet and nutrition arising as uh, separate but similar themes. So unsurprisingly, people eat fruits and vegetables because they want a healthy and nutritious diet. Um, and several concepts also arose which related to fruit and vegetable products that are good value and easy to prepare. So looking at gains now, what encourages you to eat fruits and vegetables? Uh, when we looked at the themes that arose from um, the questions that were relating to gains, the words cooked and fresh arose the most. Those are the two biggest themes. So we did a bit of a deeper dive into that to understand why those words came up. Um, as such strong themes. And it was clear that participants valued the versatility of fruit and vegetables and enjoyed the variety of ways in which you could use them. So an example might be something like, I love tomatoes because they're yummy, fresh in a salad, or they're really nice cooked on the barbecue. Uh, nutritional value and economic value were both communicated um, with many reporting, low carb, low fat, low cost, low price responses like that um, were seen as, as gains. Um, being delicious was seen as a gain. And then the, a couple of drivers of, of higher consumption came through in the gain. So there was a question within the um, sort of subset that were gains, which was what would encourage you to um, consume more fruits and vegetables. 
And one of those drivers was greater availability and another was taste. So in this context, what the consumers were, what the responses were saying was that taste, um, it was a desire to taste things. So, and the belief that that would um, facilitate greater consumption. So for example, the response might've been taste sampling in store or option to taste and then try recipes at home. People thought that that might encourage them to um, increase their intake. So finally, uh, if we were to look at the pain, so what are the barriers? What's really holding someone back from eating fruit and veg or eating more fruit and veg? Um, quality. Quality was the most significant pain experienced by consumers. This came through as a one word answer a lot. So for example, um, there was a question around what are the barriers to you eating fruit and veg? And someone might've written, you know, um, quality comma time comma something else, but quality just as a sole word as one word was quite common. Um, but also for those who went into a bit more detail around why they found that quality was a pain for them, the examples that I have are sort of um, needing to shop frequently to get fresh or good quality um, or not having the knowledge to assess quality. So um, consumers weren't really sure whether if they were looking at something in the fruit and veg section, is it ripe? Is it going to taste good? Um, you know, if it was an apple, they weren't sure how to tell if it would be flowery or not, that kind of thing. Um, waste and packaging were also big pains for consumers. They are sort of two separate things because uh, waste referring to having more produce than you're able to eat and some going, some spoiling and um, packaging being around how it's actually packaged. Participants communicated that having um, the time to acquire what they need to produce an enjoyable fruit and veg based meal, um, that was also identified as something that could be difficult. So the response could have been, it takes a lot of time cutting it up or um, that they needed to really consider how to prepare it and how to make it tasty. And finally, um, this lack of taste or tastelessness were sort of um, also seen as barriers or pains. So obviously there are a couple of gains and pains that seem a little bit contradictory, um, but that is uh, of course the case. Some people like fruits and veg more than others. Um, so there's always going to be a couple of um, gains and pains that are sort of opposite ends to each other. So uh, our conclusions. Firstly, we have a few conclusions about the consumer. Um, we define the consumer as a dormant explorer. So when participants were asked about um, when the last time that they tried a new fruit or vegetable was, um, it was revealed that participants infrequently tried new fruits and vegetables, although they were keen to. Most couldn't recall when the last time they tried something new was, or they stated that it was several years ago. But looking at the other responses to some of the other questions, it was really quite evident that people did want to try new things. Um, There's just a bit of a barrier with knowing how or having the opportunity to. We also saw um, that participants um, cook or prepare a lot of fruit and vegetables from scratch with a, about 87% saying that they always cook from fresh or raw fruits and vegetables rather than purchasing a partially prepared or fully prepared or cooked vegetables or fruits. Um, we also identified that participants are highly waste resistant. Um, so participants are primarily concerned about minimizing waste in terms of size or portion. Um, a major pain happens when they have to purchase a big bunch or a pack of something and it spoils, or if it's an item like a pumpkin that um, comes in a larger size than they can, then, then they are able to consume before it spoils. Um, this was problematic for consumers because the wastage meant that the produce was um, worse value for them, but also from an environmentally sustainable um, point of view. Um, another pain was when smaller sizes are offered, but they are wrapped excessively or individually. This is obviously a bit tricky because of the issue around convenience and time and consumers wanting cooking and eating to be made easier for them. So we identified two ways that we see that innovation can really help based on the results that we had. Firstly, through product innovation. So new products that minimize waste and offer various scales for purchase. Um, examples could be mixed packs, mini versions of existing larger fruits or vegetables, um, minimal or compostable packaging, and products that make use of fruit and veg waste or other byproducts, although um, this shouldn't stray too far from what the original um, product is. And uh, the other innovation that we really thought could help would be position in innovation. So 
consumer awareness and education would be really, really valuable um, in addressing consumption of fruit and vegetable. People are nearly there when it comes to taking the leap to try and new fruits and vegetables, but they just need a bit of support and a bit of encouragement to do that. So um, encouragement via recipe cards or specials, or as I mentioned, sort of in-store tastings um, could really help with uptake. So that's it from me. Uh, my contact details there if anyone did want to chat further, but for now, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Um, that was a lovely uh, presentation and I, I really like uh, the work. I think uh, a lot more into the consumer insights is really interesting. I, I'm over to you, Darren. I understand there is a number of uh, questions in the uh, Q&A function. There are. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, You're Bonnie, the first question for you, the average age of your sample was 55 years old. Do you yeah. think the same jobs to be done by the fruits and vegetable is relevant for younger age brackets? And I'll, sure. I'll extend that and say older age brackets as well. Sure. Um, I did it about 10 minutes ago, have a quick squeeze at what our range actually was. So I can tell you. <laughs> so I'm glad I did that. And I can tell you that the range was 19 to 90. So we did have um, a decent range there. Um, I, I, um, I feel like to answer that would really just be my, my viewpoint. But yes, essentially, I do think that health is the main reason that people eat fruits and vegetables. We know they're good for us. They're is an enormous amount of marketing around it and health messaging. Um, it's sort of something that we're told from the time we're able to listen to our parents that eating your fruits and vegetables is important. So I think that that health wouldn't change. Um, it is interesting though how some said uh, good value and ease of preparation. I do think that um, that might not be everyone and that that theme might have only arisen because of certain people who are more experienced. Um, so I. I arguably, I haven't, I can't say for sure, um, we haven't analysed that, but it is plausible that that could be the, those who are more experienced and the less experienced might not have, might not have said something like um, good value or ease of preparing. Question without notice, so you haven't seen it come up on the screen. Do you, do you think there's a difference between those people, what they eat for themselves and what they might buy for their children? Uh, I think that there would be. Um, but yeah, it's we didn't actually um, ask any. We had we didn't gather any data on uh, what you might prepare for yourself versus what you might prepare for your family. And I think that could actually be a really interesting extension. We do. Um, I think that there is sort of research available that suggests that um, children that there is some um, uh, sort of benefits to children around like mini things. I think that children particularly like those innovations, but um, like sort of mini carrots or mini cucumbers, but that's not something that we looked at. And also in the demographics, because you've just looked at it a few minutes ago, Bonnie, so this will be oh, you're easy to answer. Now. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you look at um, different ethnic groups as part of the, the study? No, we didn't. Well, there's another extension on that research that's Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, we have one question asking if this research is going to be publicly available. Is that something you're planning yes. to, to do? Yes, it is. It's very, um, very close to publication. I can't really say much more than that, but fingers crossed, maybe early in the new year, it would be available. And um, we'd be very happy to sort of disseminate that um, once it is available. I'm not, perhaps we can talk later about how that would work, but very happy to distribute it to this audience. Fantastic, thank you. And I think this is probably the last question, Ingrid. Um, what was the most interesting part of the process for you in gaining consumer insights? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I think that the way that consumers have sort of, the way that consumers are evolving, I found very interesting that there's this huge care about waste, which I think is quite topical and quite, um, well, I say new without a real time frame to that newness, but I think that it, I was really quite pleased <laughs> to see that people really care about how their produce gets to them. They don't want to waste what they've got. Um, and they, I, I was also really pleased to see that 
I'm not so pleased to see that people weren't trying that many new things that often. I suppose <laughs> that does come down to availability as well. Um, you know, personally, I love fruits and vegetables, but I haven't tried. And actually, that's not true. I tried a gold, golden kiwi fruit three days ago. So I have tried something new recently. But um, the fact that people are keen to try new things and they want to be eating more um, fruits and vegetables and they just need a bit of support, that to me was quite um, exciting. Fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you okay. very much. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, let's, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our second speaker, Ian Hill. Uh, he uh, is uh, coming from Sydney, where I come from as well. Um, Ian is a qualified chef with more than 18 years experience uh, in a variety of sectors in both Australia and the British food industry. Um, Ian is a general manager of Creative Food Solutions, and they provide uh, large scale cooked foods and ready meals um, to uh, Australia's largest supermarket chains and food services and so on. Um, Ian has been at the forefront of designing and producing uh, ready meals, which I understand is actually quite new for Australia. Me coming from England, there was, you know, you go into the supermarket shelves and half of them are all with these uh, ready meals. So it'd be very interesting to hear how this has evolved um, here in Australia uh, against the changing consumer tastes and preferences. So Ian's going to talk about ready to eat meals, designing and adapting with changing consumer needs. Over to you, Ian. Thank you, Ingrid. Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. As you can hear from the accent, it is quite strong, but I have been here for many, many years, so I didn't really see much of the ready meals in England before I came over as a backpacker. So I have been here for getting on for 26 years now, so I've been here to see that development all the way from the start. Um, but just to give you an insight of who Create Food Solutions are, I just wanted to uh, move on, if we can make my slide move on to the next page. Uh, basically, Andrew's Meats, we uh, cre founded Creative Food Solutions in 2005. It was a way of Andrew's Meats to basically move into the cooked area of food into the Australian restaurant industry, um, and then partnered with executive chefs from the Olympics. They were the executive head chefs from the Olympics who came into the business to basically try and develop the product and develop the range further. Make that move on to the next bit. There we go. Uh, we then moved into a very large, lush four and a half thousand square meter commercial kitchen in Lincoln, uh, which has allowed us to develop and launch our first ready meal range with Aldi, getting on there in 2008. So, very at the start of the ready meals in the Australian market. We only lasted one year in there. We won a number of awards. Uh, and in 2009, uh, Woolworths came knocking. And we launched there the next in our range, which was the Emily's Kitchen range. This was basically the, the first ready meal range launched with the Woolworths team under a, an illustrious leader, John Martin, who I might believe could be on this actual link watching this, where he was at the forefront who came and knocking to launch these ready meals across the Australian market. We then been going along nicely until a, a certain large Meat company came and knocking in 2014, JBS Australia, who uh, came in and have taken a controlling share in our business. Uh, they don't control us completely. Uh, I don't think they fully understand what we do. So they leave us that autonomy to drive and develop the market. Uh, but it's very nice having a large company like that sitting behind us to give us that impetus, drive and availability of meat in the Australian market, especially at these times that we're in, to keep going in this market. 700,000 ready meals a week, 260 tons of cut product a week is going through this through our facility. So from customers of all the major retailers uh, to major restaurant change to QR, QSR companies uh, to large, large uh, restaurant change just came from one of a certain uh, Swedish organization that we provide the protein for across all their restaurants. So we have got a very diverse market that we look at and expand into over the last few years with that large backing that we've got. Now, the process we use, this is where we get into the, uh, the nuts and bolts of what we do. We're a sous vide cooker. Uh, what we do basically is cook things using the sous vide cooking technique. Now, in, a, in effect, this is French for cooked under vacuum. And what we're doing is we're taking our product and we're adding a VSP film 
uh, which is causing a vacuum in our meals. And we are then dropping those into a water bath. Uh, and what we are doing there is cooking them low and slow. We're having the effect here that we're making the product to be beautiful, tender. So from our chefing days, from my time in the kitchens, the only way I would ever cook a steak that was anything over $50 a kilo would be to sous vide it first and then ought to finish it in a pan because you never want to take the risk of overcooking a steak that costs more than your evening's uh, takings in the restaurant. So sous vide has always been a, a real part of the restaurant industry. We've just taken that to that next level back in 2008 by taking the tanks to a superhuman level. So our tanks that can do a thousand meals or one ton of product. By moving on to the next part of that slide. Uh, by doing that, then we've uh, been able to create shelf life. Now this has been our major point at the start of our development was to give a ready meal that we could then take across Australia, across all the retailers. Uh, by giving us this product and process of cooking, we are giving a 6D listeria kill to all our meals, which basically means if our product stays under vacuum and the steel seal remains intact, and then it stays in a fridge, we can get anywhere between 30 to 40 days shelf life on any of our products, which is fantastic for the retail market because it allows us to distribute across all of our country uh, out of our one kitchen in Sydney. It also gives the retailers the security knowing that they can have anywhere up to three to four weeks of their product on the shelf, uh, which allows the customer plenty of time to buy it, but more importantly, it reduces the shrinkage that retailers might see on their shelves. So it's all good for us all. We can keep moving these slides on, please. Thank you. And again to the next one, please. There we go. Um, as I said, they're the 6D Listeria Kill is how we then maintain that shelf life. It also, like I said, as we're dealing with proteins here, it also gives the meat a real soft and uh, moist texture. So the reason really we went into sous vide were those two main reasons. The sous vide had to give us the shelf life and to give us the uh, uh, quality of the meal. Health was basically a bonus. Because we've got such a long shelf life with our cooking process, it just means we don't need to add anything within to the product, any artificial colors, preservatives, or additives that will give us the shelf life. So we've got a very clean method of cooking. So this really, over the last probably five years, has directed us towards this health side of the market in the ready meal space, because our process basically is a clean way of cooking. But so people came knocking on our door uh, from other retailers and for other manufacturers to look at how we could produce their ready meals to them. If we can take that slide on, please, a couple of minutes more, please. If we can go to the next slide now, thank you. So the health meal manufacturer, this is where our shift over the last five years has really moved towards these health conscious ready meals. As you can see there for a few meals you might've seen on the shelves in many of the retailers, we have become the ready meal producer in this market. As I say to many people, I don't care what sleeve goes on the product. All we care about is producing this high quality ready meal of clean ingredients. I think this is the main output here because we're able to not have to add anything to it. That means our ingredient decks on the back can be clean. We have no E numbers. We know, have no strange letters that go on things that confuse customers. There are only whole ingredients that are easy to understand and easy to digest literally by the customer. So as you can see there, we've, we've gone into Healthy Every Day where we went down the paleo road. Uh, we've done our own healthy appetite range in Metcash. The classic Coles, low carb, I'll come back to that one, and the Weight Watchers uh, have been our main brands. But it was that classic Coles, low carb range that really kind of drew us to the CSIRO probably about two years ago. Um, they saw that meal on the shelf uh, and came knocking. And together with them, we've kind of gone down this journey of really now taking the health conscious ready meal to that logical conclusion that we all believe in. Um, I think the main statement I really want to touch on here is food is medicine and medicine is food. Uh, where we believe the market is going towards now is how customers can now go to a supermarket, buy a ready meal that is of quality, of reasonable price, but they know when they put it into their systems that they know they're eating healthily. That's where we sit at CFS is how we see the market developing over the next five years. 
we've seen the rise of the, the protein meals, high protein meals recently that have hit the market. So we can see how now in the gyms and the younger element buying these ready meals for that purpose has really exploded. Uh, but there isn't a real health conscious ready meal that sits there out in the market. So with ourselves and the CSIRO, we are embarking on this journey next year where we've been working very hard as you can see, since 2019, uh, we have had a thing called COVID that came in, which impacted the ready meal market in quite a great way and quite a not so great way. Yes, when the when the first uh, wave hit, I won't deny it, it was fantastic for business because the herd mentality going through supermarkets cleaned out shelves. Eventually it got to the ready meal shelf and let's just say our sales went through the roof. But we know that wasn't uh, a real indictment of where the market was. It was just a case of a big hit. It was a great hit. I will not deny it was enjoyable to get through it. Uh, but what has also came through from the COVID revolution, as I call it, is the rise of the ready meal. We now see many, many different ready meals across the market coming through from small operators, from B2C models that are now expanding into retail. There's such a wide choice now than when we first started with Emily's Kitchen way back when, when there was only three meal providers doing that meal. Uh, but now you can go into any retailer and buy a multitude of meals from all different ethnic types, different health conscious, different qualities, different price points. Uh, but what we believe here is that we do not see a true healthy range within the market. So this is where we're going to embark on now. And this is where we see the ready meal going now over the next five years. So combining with the low carb diet market that we see with the CSIRO and their fantastic uh, diet books from Grant and Penny that have come out over the last few years is to take that concept and turn that into a ready meal. Uh, in those first few meetings, I must admit with the CSRO and Grant, the one line that really kind of penetrated into my soul was the concept that creating a ready meal range that could reverse the first signs of type 2 diabetes. And that is what this low carb diet range is really about. And this is something at CFS that we really believe in. It's how we can make a change in someone's life, but make a change in a good way. Yes, there's low carb meals out in the market and you see them on the shelves. They're very hard to miss because they're usually screaming low carb in very big letters on their packaging. So our concept is to come to market very soon. Now, we will be approaching the retailers over the next few weeks ready for next year launch with a, a new and interesting range that is based around this low carb diet. But we also then are branding ourselves that allows us to develop that market into different meals as well. We see a market in gut health. We, we know gluten free is a massive thing. So there's a way that we can bring these meals under a healthy brand out into the market. The issue that we've had, firstly, is hitting the, the points that we need in order to get this low carb diet off and going and follow the rules of the CSIRO. So this range will hit all those points and it will confirm, conform to their two year science uh, that they've just conducted. And those ready meals will have all the correct uh, food groups, correct carbs, sodium levels that mean that if you eat this meal and you follow the, the guidelines of this, you can reverse those first signs of type two, type two diabetes which to me is a massive goal that we've got at this business. Yes, before we all jump in, yes, I am the GM. Yes, profitability. Yes, making money is a fantastic thing that we all want to do. But to actually give a customer something that actually helps them is a fantastic thing for us to do here and a fantastic thing for our staff here to do because we all know what we're doing and what we're having an impact on people's lives but doing it in a way that's not boring. We all know that diets take things out of what we're eating. What we are planned to do and what you'll see here, and I think the evolution that you're seeing in the ready meal market is to make diets fun, to provide interesting, different meals, fantastic tastings that hit that diet point that we need to be. What we aim to do here is to create a ready meal range that is a choice rather than something that they have to do. We don't want people picking up this meal because they have to, because that's what their doctors said. We want people picking this meal up because they want to eat this meal. So basically in conclusion, what I'm just trying to show you guys here is ready meals are going on this trajectory. We've moved from those uh, ovenable meals that we used to see in the late 90s, 80s, 
that we're terrible out of the freezer, but as they've developed over the last 12, 20 years, we are now really moving towards that health conscious meal. And most meals that you pick up are low in sodium, thanks to the work done by our major retailers at Woolworths and Coles, as they've lowered the sodium numbers each year, as there is an actual feeling of safe um, providing the customer with that healthy option. Ready Bills now, in my opinion, is where they will go now over the next two, 10 years, and hopefully with CFS at the forefront, creating those different brands that allow people to eat healthily and live longer. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ian. That was excellent. And um, as I'm the curator, I'm going to ask the, the, uh, a question, please. Um, I'm very interested in in how the ready meals have changed, and you alluded to what was, you know, in the 1980s and 90s, which weren't very nice, to something that's really, you know, chef produced, you know, sous vide used. But I've, I, I found that often um, processed food still has a bit of a stigma with, with consumers, or especially around the health and nutrition. Um, do you know what we can do to uh, encourage uh, consumers to see that, uh, that processed foods can be very good for you, can be very healthful, and sometimes even healthier than, say, well, possibly even cooking at home if you're not a very good cook, but certainly, uh, you know, even eating raw food, you can't really digest a lot. So do you have a view on that of how we can educate? Yes, it, it's to me, it's the ingredient declaration on the back of packs. The flip over of a pack has now become second nature for most people when they walk down the aisles. It's making that ingredient deck simple, easy and clean. Um, in, in, in none of our ready meals, there is nothing processed. Everything is made fresh on site, fresh sources made here, all our meats, vegetables brought in, steamed and gone straight into the meal. So it's a how we can make what the old days of when you'd pick an ingredient deck up that could be like you, it's massive. So now what we can see now on our new meal is where it's basically three sentences, which is in just including maybe four different food types and their percentages and a very simple understanding of what it is. You need the call out on the packaging, but we don't need the packaging to be overstated. I think what we see now on the shelves is basically this cluttered effect, which is causing confusion uh, and making people's choices hard. So what you'll see in the next range is coming out is very simple, uh, information on the packs. I think it's be one of the first times we're going to be launching a range of meals without a picture of the actual meal on front. It's just going to be the ingredients, the pictures of the actual ingredients that are very clear and to the point. There'll be a picture on the side because everyone wants to see what it looks like, but it, it's that concept of let's not think about um, all the bells and whistles. Let's just call out what it is. It's a low carb meal. It's healthy. It's good for you. Yes, we're going to have the socials behind it, which allows people to then go into it to see all the details of the diet and allows people to deep dive into the CSIRO diet, also to deep dive into who CSF, CFS are, to see our process and to understand what we do, but to keep it clean, simple and easy to understand. Ian, uh, what technical question are you? What's the storage temperature for your 30 to 40 day shelf life? Is this chilled? That is chilled. One to four degrees is what we have done. But within retailers, we also abuse test to seven degrees. So very simple, very clean, and very easy to do. Do you still see a place for frozen ready meals in the future or are they... Um... The dinosaurs. They, they are the dinosaurs. They are the dinosaurs. They're the dinosaurs. Because at the end of the day, yes, like I tell many people, protein and sauce, no issues to freeze. It's when you're freezing vegetables, when you're freezing sauces that has a water content in there. Once it's then frozen and then it's defrosted, we get a molecular breakdown, which basically makes things soggy. So the quality of the food goes down. So it's not that it's not a bad thing to freeze, but if you're trying to produce a quality meal, um, I'll give you an example, we do a Woolworths ready meal, which is a hand wrapped prosciutto chicken breast that's done in a sage infused gravy with green beans, uh, sweet potato mash and a, a leek coolie. And we've got a three cavity tray that allows you to put all those ingredients into those separate containers. And then when you warm it up and plate it up, you can plate it up literally like a restaurant quality meal. So you can actually layer it rather than just a pile of mush, which we do see in a lot of trays to give that customer that feel that hey they are eating something quality and it looks good as well so no to frozen chilled is the only way especially when you've got 30 days on a shelf and as i say to many retailers if you can't sell a ready meal in 30 days i don't think you should be selling a ready meal <laughs> very good um ingrid i'm just noticing the time but you've 
oh no, you've moved across somewhere else. Is that the uh, the impact of the thunder and lightning outside my window? Is it? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. My my computer's just completely blanked out. It's uh, there was a, a shortage, so apologies for that. Where are we? Am I? I'm introducing Craig. Yes, well, thank you, Ian, first. Oh, thank you, Ian. Yes, sorry. <laughs> My apologies. Thank you very much, Ian. You, that was Maggie. excellent. And I'm looking forward to trying your meals, I must say, actually. Um, they sound delicious. Thank you. All right. Uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce our last speaker of uh, the, uh, the trio, Craig Agnew. Um, He's uh, from sunny Queensland, um, so that's, well, I hope it's nicer weather than I'm hearing here. Uh, Craig is the Managing Director and CEO of the Happy Stack uh, uh, Company. Uh, he has been a career consumer packaged goods executive uh, of global scale, where he has led the development of successful international foods and agribusiness brands, including Heinz, Gourmet Garden and Avo Fresh. So they're all well known and everyone I'm sure have, have, has, has had those products. Um, Craig is going to discuss how the Happy Snack family has used a design led mindset uh, and, and practices to grow their business. So that, that's really, really, uh, for me, an interesting um, area. So he, he's calling it using design led thinking to transform a business, the Happy Snack food story. Over to you. Well, thanks, Deb. Great. Thanks for the thanks for the opportunity to uh, chat with you all today. Um, just by way of orientation, it is sunny on the Sunshine Coast today, although it's it's been pretty wet um, lately, as it has been many parts of the East Coast. Um, uh, but I'm I'm speaking to you from our purpose-built facility uh, here in Landsborough, just back from the coast. Uh, this presentation I'm going to give you today uh, relates to some work that was done by the Australian Design Council um, and results from a, a partnership uh, we had with FIAL also, uh, which led to the creation of, of some new products um, uh, that are presently on the shelves in, in Woolworths and Coles. Uh, they're in the UK and also um, in New Zealand as well too. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, how we created those products, uh, but also how I think design principles informed um, how we established the business. So this is a, a small privately held company. Our sole focus uh, has been to uh, improve the nutrition of snack foods. So uh, I, I agree with Ian's comment around uh, how um, uh, nutrition is critical. Um, lots of our snack foods uh, that we've been consuming for the last 30 or 40 years are relatively high in fat and sugar. And the lovely thing about um, the core ingredients of chickpeas and beans and legumes in general is they're about 50% fiber and protein. Um, and that's, that's um, nutritionally what, what's more important for us to consume. So uh, let's move on to the uh, second stage, second page of the presentation, if we could. Um, and let's go one more. Uh, this, present, this presentation is actually available at the Design Council website. Um, so I'm largely going to speak to the relevance of these steps and what we did um, uh, in order to develop our products. So from a, from a defined point of view, um, this is a cycle that's well established. Define the problem you're solving for, uh, understand the consumer, ideate, prototype, execute. There's nothing unique about this, but I suppose what's um, relevant for our business is when we thought about the define and what we needed to do, we wanted to make sure that um, uh, the business wasn't called the Happy Snack Company. It was actually established in 92 and it was called Partner Foods. Uh, and the process we went through uh, from about 2011, 12 was around clarifying our purpose, um, making sure that we were clear what we wanted to do and made choices around what we were going to exclude from our frame of reference. So ultimately, we saw ourselves as a snack food business. Um, at the time, we had a couple of products um, in Woolies nationally, um, and they've been a, a, a really important um, customer of ours uh, for many, many years. Uh, but our, our products were um, uh, quite limited format in format, and we thought the brand Partner Foods didn't do anything to communicate an emotional connection, didn't do anything to establish the sort of relationship that 
that consumers could have with us. So we focused on snacks. We love the nutritional properties of um, Australian grown chickpeas and other legumes, but that high protein, high fiber content led to constraints. They're tough to eat um, as a seed. Um, you know, it, it wasn't designed to be consumed. It was designed to be flung out uh, after a drought and then uh, the plant would propagate when the next lot of rain came. So unlike many fruits, uh, which uh, have been uh, have evolved to uh, be wonderful for either animals or many animals to consume, that's not the case with these seeds. So we needed to address the technical challenge as well, understanding that there were benefits from a nutritional point of view. One of the key other benefits was that they are free from all allergens. And that enabled us to start thinking about, well, how do we position nutritious, safe food that is palatable, fun to eat? Again, a comment that Ian made. Um, and how might we convey that through a brand and packaging design um, that is more appropriate than, than uh, where we were with partner foods? So that's, that's the journey we set ourselves. Um, and that's how we define the problem. Um, the, the, let's um, flick a page now and, and uh, in the presentation, if we could. And ultimately, uh, where we got to with this process was to take our core chickpeas and understanding that um, if we could keep them um, free from allergens, if we could improve the palatability, if we could keep the great nutrition uh, and the high protein fiber content, but add um, palatability and also uh, understand the consumer needs in ways that enabled there to be incremental sales for our brand, then we felt that um, that, was, that was what we were trying to solve. So let's go one more page, if we could. So I talked about the, defining uh, the opportunity uh, in terms of uh, we had a base business, it was small, but um, let's drill into the, those consumers that were um, not able to consume snacks, principally because there were allergens in there that they couldn't consume. Uh, and let's understand who their needs were and also try and create a segmentation model for who was consuming healthy snacks to try and understand if that core consumer, um, their needs could be expressed in a way that made sense to them, but also other consumers who have made, may have subtly different needs. Let's go on one more page. So in terms of um, empathizing with those consumers, uh, the principles of, and, and as Bonnie talked about, talking to people, asking open questions, visiting them, listening to see how they respond. Um, there was uh, both quantitative and qualitative research that was done. And it was exploring the idea of how, how can we um, better meet the needs of a particular segment. Now those allergy conscious consumers uh, have increased in size in Australia and in much of the Western world. So particularly people who can't consume gluten or making choices about um, vegan or vegetarian food or, the, or those uh, consumers for whom nuts is dangerous uh, or, or other um, allergens that cause disruption and concern. When we spoke to those people and spoke to the mums, um, it was clear that that key life point where your child goes off to school and they're no longer consuming what you hand them um, is, a, is a it's a very emotional time for everybody and where safety is overlaid um, that was that was particularly um, important it, it also was evident to us that young kids going to school who are consuming food that doesn't look normal um, uh, the self-esteem and being part of that crowd, being part of the, the environment is really important for young people. And so what we wanted to do was celebrate good, healthy food that was made from um, uh, legumes that had flavors and was packaged in a way that was fun and exciting. And, and you know, it could be a celebration um, for children. And so the idea of the design around um, how does it look like a lunchbox um, how does it have branding that it's exciting? How does it have flavors that are of interest to kids? That was important for us, but it wasn't the only thing that was important for us too. We needed to explore um, our, our consumption preferences when we're on the go around different day parts. So uh, in doing this research, we understood that what we consume for breakfast is different from what we wanna consume uh, later in the day. And 
uh, we tend to relax um, our high ideals. The morning is is often where we have extremely healthy food and um, and we're starting the day, you know, um, uh, living the perfect life. Um, after a bit of stress in the afternoon, it's where's the chocolate or or towards the end of the day, it's you know, open the bubbly and and I'm just I'm so I'm pleased I've just survived to get to here. So um, we wanted to recognize that as um, a needs change emotionally and also um, physically, um, then the idea of introducing allergen-free products um, that met that those changing taste needs during the day uh, and gave an opportunity for lighter indulgence, which is our chocolate coating products, was about creating incrementality and also solving um, for those consumers that didn't have choices with their allergies. Um, the design process for us was also about exploring with a, with a really good consumer segmentation model of who was shopping that health food aisle. Uh, we could understand that there are other um, consumer needs that we could also appeal to. So there are folks that are um, more ethical in their choices. Uh, um, and, and that may uh, transpire in terms, or may be reflected in terms of being making vegan choices or vegetarian choices. Um, uh, distance of how far food travels, for example, may be important. Um, there, are, there are other folks who are more interested uh, in, um, in performance nutrition. Um, there are others who are just interested in, in making a better alternative to the, the normal snacks that they have been consuming for a long time. Uh, and it may be, as Ian said, due to the doctor said, unless you change your behaviour, you know, you're, uh, you're going to face major consequences. So there are different uh, ages and stages of life where um, health priorities change. And so uh, as we've thought about school age, moving into adolescence, moving from home, into the workforce, um, living busy mobile lives, um, be it uh, professional teachers or nurses or uh, people in, in all forms of the medical environment, um, their ability to have a snack on the go when they needed it that met their nutritional needs and was also safe for them, they were the problems we were solving. So um, that, that led us to a, a, a redefining the brand. We went from Partner Foods to uh, the Happy Snack Company. And um, that led us to developing a range of flavors that was about understanding taste preferences and also led, led us to figure out how we would solve, how do you make chocolate that's allergen free? Um, it was a significant challenge. It involved traveling to Italy, um, working with Milan University, working with um, uh, uh, suppliers of um, the, the manufacturing equipment for um, artisan uh, chocolate companies, um, bringing that back to Australia, integrating that into our own operation. So for us, the manufacturing uh, process to avoid risk was around doing it ourselves, doing it our own purpose-built facility. But, but that was secondary to having a very clear idea of who the consumer was. Let's flick on um, to the next one, please. I've talked a little bit about how we, how we ideated around what did the product need to look like? What did the, what messages needed to be communicated? Um, and then the prototype process was more about, well, how do we solve for that? So one key message is we started with the consumer. We drilled deeply into the consumer before we started to look at how we would solve the, um, the food tech problems uh, and how we would uh, develop concepts to trial. Let's move on again. And, and so our execution model was in part, how do we make this product? How do we communicate it? Um, how do we, uh, you know, how do we, what do we invest in terms of um, building awareness among those consumers? But also was around what business model do we wanna have? So how do we make sure that we've got um, an ownership um, group that's committed to this, is solely focused on solving this problem because it's a difficult problem to solve. So what essentially the challenge we were facing was how do we take uh, a product, i.e. legumes and chickpeas that are um, at best unusual, maybe completely unknown, and try and bring them into a mainstream snacking consumption point um, from pretty much a zero start? So, so the, the branding, the, the building trust around the right brand, communicating that's what we were about, 
launching the right products, and then also aligning our organization around, so what do we need to do in terms of what is, how are we gonna grow? Who are we gonna target? Which consumers, which, um, which sales channel? Um, what do we need to invest in, in terms of our operating capability? Um, that led to a, a, a decision to move away from a, 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 a smaller facility to a purpose-built facility, um, to invest in new equipment that was faster, that was better able to control what we needed to do, and, and also led us to invest in people and networks of knowledge um, that uh, enabled us to operate like a big multinational company that just happened to be focused on this very tight niche that was our sole reason for, for being. So uh, uh, our execution process was around creating a vision document. This is what success looks like. We're all engaged in this. And then some very clear staged growth objectives around how we would build that capability. Um, so let's flick on. Uh, and let's go one more. So in summary, what success for us was about uh, establishing the category, um, communicating to our retail partners that there's a true incremental opportunity around making snacks that are healthy, uh, that are tasty and fun, and, and can be accessed by all consumers. Um, and that's led to really rapid growth uh, for the brand. We only launched the brand in 2015, um, and uh, we're already at over 20% household awareness and regularly consumed by around a fifth of households in Australia. It's enabled us to replicate that model and, um, and ship to the UK. So we're, we're in Waitrose and, and Sainsbury now, uh, also in New Zealand, as I mentioned, and, and there's other markets that we're targeting um, internationally. So really it's, we see this as a global opportunity to make healthy legumes that are grown in Australia more accessible because they're healthier uh, and because they can be safe because of their inherent properties. Um, and we can make them uh, uh, tasty and fun, um, largely because the snack food industry has used other ingredients and, and um, have kind of bypassed these. But Australia is fantastic at growing these. Millions of tons of these products are grown. They're wonderful for the environment in terms of uh, nitrogen fixing, a really good rotation crop, uh, and they're largely exported uh, without a lot of um, uh, added value. So we saw there being an opportunity to help Australia grow its food business by establishing a brand and help the community have uh, healthier options uh, that were safer for that particular segment who, whose needs were largely unmet, but could then be made more broadly available to a, a wider group of customers. Uh, so we're on the journey. Um, we're having a lot of fun um, and we've still got a long way to go. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. I'm, I've got thunder and lightning and heavy rain <laughs> all around me at the moment, and I think we're, I think it might have knocked Werribee out. But Craig, there's been a few people asking to get a copy of the recording, which we will share with people afterwards. Um, it was a fantastic journey that you you went through there, and I, what I've always loved with the food industry is the the real understanding of the consumer. If you don't get that consumer insight, you you go broke pretty quickly. Um, but I, what I also really liked was one of your slides where um, you had a hunch. It seemed to be the uh, <laughs> it seemed to be the way that it all it it all started. There wasn't this incredible um, compartmentalization of different consumers and and those needs. It was starting with a hunch and then exploring out. How long did that process take? Well, I think the hunch probably started in 92 when the business was founded um, by Jonathan. And um, he understood 20% um, uh, protein, 20% fiber in, in a food product um, is much more suitable. Um, I suppose what it took us a long time to figure out was, so how do we make that palatable? Uh, how do we, you know, there's pros and cons of that. So, yeah, I suppose it's, it, it's, uh, in scientific terms, you know, you could call it a hypothesis, but fundamentally it was um, if these products are being consumed as snack foods in the Middle East, Caribbean, North Africa, um, uh, many parts of the world where uh, there are very few uh, choices around food, 
um, and yet they are delivering um, nutritionally for those consumers. Now, why did the West forget that? And I think when we start from our um, our origins, most of, many of us are from Western Europe, and and our our ancestors grew the crops that could survive in the harsh climate that was there. Um, uh, so the hunch was sort of born of it's being done elsewhere. We're growing so much of these products. Um, how? What? Why don't we? Why don't we solve the the challenges that exist so we can uh, present them in a way that's more palatable for our, for the Western consumer? So um, it's both both a branding and a and a I suppose a nutritionally founded hunch. Um, but also there was um, you know the number of food technologists in our business, and it was we can solve for this. We can figure out how to make these more palatable. And, and we committed ourselves to that journey um, because no one had really done it before. So, um, so we had both a branding challenge, how do we win the confidence of people and also a technical challenge of how do we um, solve? So I suppose there's a, there was a number of hunches and educated guesses that it was solvable, but we just needed to figure out, um, did we have the resources and resolve to do this? Yeah, and there were some technical challenges and other challenges there, but what about the challenge of actually engaging consumers and understanding those markets? Is that a, an ongoing process? Is that a multi-year process? I think when we, it's, it's an ongoing um, issue for us. We recently did some consumer research in the UK and a different segmentation model there. Um, We've tended to focus on Western markets because we think there's a greater alignment around, um, I suppose, how how Western consumers think about food and how our thoughts have changed around food. You know, 90% of it's the same, 10% is different. So when you're trying to pioneer a new category uh, or develop the snack food um, uh, segment for healthy foods, um, yeah, there's, there's, we felt a lot of the learnings um, we, we could replicate or we could, we weren't starting from scratch, but um, we were refining all the time. We were always exploring how we might improve the taste and texture. So essentially that protein and fiber means it's very firm. So relative to other texture uh, snack foods, which are light and crunchy, um, we need to figure out how we, how we make them light and crunchy. And that's an ongoing journey. And we need to test how, how, how we're getting on um, with research. So, uh, so, but in terms of the foundations around the brand and how it's understood and solving for a whole family who has to who has snacking needs, you know, often with diet restricted consumers, it's one in the family everyone's in. So, um, uh, we wanted to make it, we wanted to avoid that exclusion and have it fun and everyone could participate and and do that because it was tasty and nutritious, as as uh, other speakers have talked about. So I guess that's a, a good way to wrap up today's session as fun, tasty and nutritious <laughs> has been the, what we're trying to do as, as we try and understand what the consumers are, are looking for. I know we've gone a bit over time and I'm, um, I'm struggling to hear here because the rain is pelting down at the moment. Uh, so I'd just like to thank uh, Bonnie, thank Ian and thank Craig for fantastic presentations today. We're really, really pleased with... Um, Everything that I've heard today is amazing, and I, I think we, we will run some other sessions next year with um, CSIRO and La Trobe and, and go more into the consumer into the consumer side as well. And to, um, to those of you who've joined us today, thank you for joining us. There's some contact details on the slide that you can see right now. Um, really keen if people want to um, be connected with our speakers, we're happy to do that for you. Uh, and also keen to understand other areas and topics that people would like us to talk about in, in our sessions in, in 2022. So thanks again for our speakers today. Um, thank you very much for Lauren for your work in, in setting everything up for us and to Deb and